Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Harriet, and I work on the programme for the Built Environment Trust here at the Building Centre. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to tonight's event, Housing, How Architects Can Design for Wellbeing and Equality. Um, and this is part of the Making Wellbeing exhibition and event series taking place here until the end of January. Um, please note that tonight's event is being live streamed and filmed, and it will be shared online in the coming weeks. Um, so please make sure that your phones are switched to silent, um, and in case of emergency, please exit through the three doors at the back and make your way up the stairs to leave the building. So I'll now hand over to our chair for the evening, Peg Rawls, um, who is Professor of Architecture and Philosophy at the Barlett School of Architecture, University College London. And she is co-author of Equal by Design, a documentary that discusses themes of equality, well-being and the UK housing crisis. So thank you, Peg. And I'll hand over to each of them who will speak in turn for 15 minutes before we have half an hour for conversation and discussion with you um, afterwards. So the first of our speakers is Peter Barber. Peter Barber runs practice of his name with uh, his colleagues who are very lively and various. And uh, Peter is an architect who trained with Richard Rogers and Alsop and also is a, is a lecturer. He has an academic uh, professional career as well as his own practice and teaches currently at the University of Westminster. Uh, Peter has a great uh, expertise in speaking publicly about his work and has talked at many institutions including the ROBA, the Architectural League of New York, and many universities in the UK, Europe, and also overseas. Um, he's also, like the other speakers, I think significant because of his contribution to policy and to discussions about the practice of architecture in a civic and in a society that is uh, socially aware. Um, and this means that he's been part of the government's uh, project to lead discussion on designing for better spaces with a team of other built environment professionals and is advisor to English Partnerships, the production of the Urban Design Compendium. Our second speaker is Sarah Wigglesworth. Sarah founded her practice in 1994, and this is a practice that you may know is very well uh, respected with its uh, expertise around sustainable design and particularly using alternative low energy materials. Uh, Sarah also has a very distinguished career in academia and has been Professor of Architecture at the University of Sheffield from 1999 to 2016 which uh, included her founding the PhD by design uh, in 2002, an early form of this uh, qualification for architects. And her academic work is very much blended with insights and consideration about life and living projects, particularly the way in which she works with her clients and the notion of the client practice uh, being very, very uh, much in hand in hand with each other. And this was in, undertaken particularly in her last academic project, which was called Dwell. And she'll be talking, I think, a little bit about Dwell tonight. It's d designing for well-being and environments for later life. Um, and this was a project where she worked with the University of Sheffield and Sheffield Council in the design of houses and neighbourhoods for older people. And Sarah's work, as you will also know, is uh, featured in the Straw Bale House and also features in her work for schools, including the Sandal Magna School in Wakefield. The third final speaker is Alex Ely, and Alex is an architect and a town planner uh, who founded his practice, May Architects, in 2001. Uh, and Alex also has a very distinguished reputation for innovative and excellence in housing and in public design programs, and also in the way in which he informs and aids government and policy thinking. Um, he's responsible for schemes which have been award-winning uh, for cultural buildings, for healthcare, uh, for educational uh, projects, and also has gained prizes from CABE and from the London Housing Design Guide. He's also an advocate, a design advocate um, uh, for the mayor as office, for CABE's built environment expert, and is a member of the GLA and the LLDC review panel, and also a member of the RIBA housing policy group. Um, I am very pleased to welcome all three. So I'm going to hand over to Peter, who will speak first. Right. Thanks, Peg. And thanks for the invite. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and talk. Um, 
well-being, equality. Well-being is quite a hard word to pin down. It's quite nebulous. It's got it's kind of catch-all phrase. So I thought it'd be interesting to push the discussion to two sort of extremes in that regard. For me, um, architecture is all about politics, and um, and can we dim these at all? Just a little bit. Um, uh, uh, and um, it seemed to me that it'd be interesting to think about the sort of the, the kind of the macro, the structural, the big ideas and, and, and structural issues w w and, and the political issues which sur surround an idea like well-being. And, uh, and then to take it to the other extreme and to think, and, and so, so in the first instance, you know, the sort of grand uh, Marxist kind of narrative and then down to, you know, the minutiae of architecture, much closer to Michel de Certo, the, the, you know, the, the everyday things, uh, the small uh, rituals in kind of uh, in, in our life within buildings, with our environment. So we start with a kind of big picture and I think any discussion about well-being, the notion of the maximum amount of happiness for the maximum amount of people has to think about the big political issues, the mismanagement of our land economy by successive governments of both complexions, which lead to a situation in which, in London, one of the richest cities the world has ever known, there are 170,000 people who are homeless, according to Christ. 150 families are losing their homes every day. And um, this um, situation is a question uh, of government policy, but it's also a matter of our culture, the way we are so heavily embedded in a sort of neo liberal uh, uh, um, culture, neoliberal economy, which allows uh, the swirling phantasmagoria of, of, of money to just sort of take resources wherever it will, you know, global capital kind of swishing around. And, 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 and the outcome of that is this. In the post-war period, when our economy was much more heavily planned, controlled even, we were building 150,000 home, uh, social homes each year. By 1975, before Ma Margaret Thatcher had her way, nearly half the population of this country lived in social housing, uh, and that has been diminished every year since then, so that we now have a situation like this. And David Cameron, in the final months of his, uh, of his uh, prime ministership, saying, post-war estates across Britain are ripe for redevelopment. We will sweep away the planning blockages take steps to reduce political and reputational risk for projects, key decision makers and investors. I believe that together we can tear down anything in our way. That in contrast to the incredible vision of the post-war Labour government. So that we now have this, the situation in which great areas of our city are being laid waste to this kind of crap. 20,000 homes uh, are empty. Um, the commodification of housing, uh, the commodification of space in the city, uh, you know, housing, uh, property in general seen as some kind of investment vehicle rather than as a, a, a basic and vital uh, infrastructure. We're quite happy to uh, sweep away um, great areas of countryside for, 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 for transport infrastructure and things like that, uh, and we think for the, for the greater good, but we cannot find it in our hearts to see housing the same way so that we get this. This is a a, a photograph taken in the subway, a few minutes walk from Apsley House and Buckingham Palace, um, and in my mind this is a scandal. These are a series of photographs taken by homeless people of their own environment, so this is somebody's living room, and this is somebody's bedroom. And uh, we all share responsibility for this, we live in a democracy, we all have the right to vote, uh, and we all have the right to um, protest, and so this is something that we all share responsibility for. Uh, by contrast, this is a flat which costs 75 million pounds, uh, and this is somebody else's bedroom. So that's what I think about equality. And, um, so, uh, and that's what I think about the sort of big political picture, which for me is as much about architecture as the next bit which I'm going to talk about, which is a more conventional and narrower um, uh, uh, definition of architecture. And for those of you who've seen me talk before, uh, talk before I apologize, I kind of apologize, but I don't in a way, because I think this quote is useful and helpful and important in helping us to think about the relationship between people and architecture, the relationship between culture 
and space, because in the one hand, we build our cities, we design our buildings, uh, and we create them, and we make decisions about how they should be laid out and formed, but then they sort of come back and impact on us. You know, we create our architecture, we design our cities, but then they come back and impact on us. So it's a complex reciprocal relationship which exists between people and architecture, and it's, and it's described very beautifully in this uh, quote from Walter Benjamin, the great uh, Marxist critic and uh, a uh, cultural anal analyst uh, in his book, One Way Street, 1924, he's describing uh, a street scene in Naples. And in it, he sort of, he captures very beautifully the idea of, of, of architecture as permeated uh, by, by people and, and, and brought to life by the activity of people. And I suppose in thinking about well-being in architecture and trying to design an architecture which has, is mindful of, of the impact it will have on people, uh, I, I always have this idea in my mind. So he says this, and, and so imagine we're in a street in, in Naples. Um, the passion for improvisation which demands that space and opportunity be at any price preserved. Buildings are used as a popular stage. They're all divided into innumerable, simultaneously animated theatres. Balcony, courtyard, windows, gateway, staircase, roof are at the same time stages and boxes. He goes on to say, as porous as the stone is the architecture, buildings and action interpenetrate in the courtyards, arcades and stairways. In everything, they preserve the scope to become a theatre of new, unforeseen constellations. The stamp of the definitive is avoided. No situation appears intended forever. So in his description of this street, he's sort of collapsing architecture and people into one thing, and he's capturing something of the th theatrical scene which can happen in space. And um, so, you know, we're known for doing housing work, um, but in, in my mind, as important as the housing is the space between the housing, and in a city like London, 70% of all of the buildings are houses or housing. So when we design housing at any scale, we're designing, designing pieces of urbanism. And for me, the, str the street is the kind of basic building block of the city and the thing that which structures kind of a lot of our housing work. And the idea that a space like this, which belongs to everybody and it belongs to no one, is a great leveler. It brings people of different uh, social backgrounds, different cultural groups, different ages into a space. And a, and a well-designed street kind of compresses that kind of social activity into a situation where we're brought together in some kind of equal setting uh, and, and, and are visible to one another and, um, and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. So this is um, Donnybrook. It's our first larger housing scheme. It's only 50 units still. But we won it by saying this scheme is a celebration of the public social life of the street. So it was an idea about the potential for the street to create this uh, kind of uh, leveling kind of effect uh, and and the, the potential of a street and, and, and public space to contribute to the well-being of people, to the happiness of people, and to uh, start to encourage. I don't think architecture has a causal relationship on behavior, but I think it can encourage and make certain sorts of behavior possible. And street-based housing with a square at the intersection uh, is, 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 in my mind, a, a, a great kind of way of thinking about that. Uh, a lot of, uh, so the next series of photographs are pictures of images of projects, not just our own, but pieces of city that I admire, uh, where there is evidence of kind of social activity and of people taking control of their environment, which in my mind is a sort of, um, a, a kind of, um, an indicator of, of kind of, uh, that, that um, of, of kind of, that, that, this, that places are kind of uh, working and that kind of well-being is being kind of created. Um, so some roof terraces, which were a precedent for the work we did at Donnybrook. Donnybrook itself with the streets. How, am I gonna, how does that work? Well, the streets and the intersection at the public square. And again, you know, Walter Benjamin would like this, wouldn't he? The sort of evidence of people taking control of the space, breathing life into. You know, architecture is inanimate, isn't it? It's abstract, and it really only becomes meaningful when these sorts of things start to happen. The shop appearing on the street corner. Courtyards being lived in. And so these, you can't predict what's going to happen when you make a building, but you kind of hope that people will feel a connection with the spaces that they're moving into 
uh, with the streets that they're occupying. I know, for instance, that this is a little window that we created on a half landing of a staircase in one of the units at Donnybrook. And I know that the little girl who grew up there did her homework sitting on the step halfway up the stairs looking out of the window over the street. This is a project in the East End in Stepney where uh, we were asked to look at making buildings on the site here. And it seemed to us that the benefit to, there could be a benefit to all of the people, not just the new residents in housing here, but the existing residents uh, could be fantastic if we created a garden which was shared by all those people. So lots of uh, our projects have kind of courtyards and, 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 or, or emphasis on the space between buildings. Um, and uh, the idea that this is, 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 is an encouragement to kind of social activity of bringing people together. So the garden at Hannibal Road connects existing residents and their gardens with the new residents of the eight or ten or whatever it is uh, houses along here. And lovely to go back again uh, and, and find people kind of taking control of that environment as an indicator, some kind of indicator of, of their enjoyment of it their happiness with it. This is a project up in, uh, in down in Peckham. Uh, and our, our, again, our idea of a, a, a courtyard, the possible sort of convivial environment which might emerge. This was a series of different uh, agencies operating out of this building who needed, who, uh, on behalf of homeless people and disadvantaged people who needed to be talking to each other. And it seemed to me that uh, that might happen if we could create a courtyard rather than a corridor, a courtyard at the center of the project. And um, so, you know, lovely events uh, and scenes unfolding in that space. And, and, you know, without the inspiration of Benjamin and, 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 and this kind of notion of, of the relationship between people and architecture, that, that space might not have occurred to me. In that project at Graham Park, a little sort of arcade, which again, in a big building, which is, you know, essentially is about um, um, the creation of, of, of wealth for our client, uh, in, in, the, in the making of housing, uh, we were able to persuade them to create this colonnade at the ground floor, which is, is kind of public spirited and civic in its intent. And here, you know, small things. You know, I'm going to just quickly um, quote Michel de Certo, if I can find it. Um, and he's taking it from the, from the big macro where we started, the absolute micro in, in the practice of everyday life, 1974. He says, Space is practiced place. Pr space is practiced place. Everyday narrative, a word caught in the ambiguity of actualization on streets, in apartments, in the most intimate of domestic habits. And I, so, so I really love that idea. And, and it makes me think about things like spaces like this at the front of a house. If you create a, a, a space like that, you know, what, what might happen there? It's a south-facing facade of a social housing project we just completed recently in Stratford. Um, before it was uh, just just the instant after it's finished, and you know the realization that sometimes at the front of a house, wonderful things can happen where people take control of the space where it edges the street. I'm going to finish with a few slides of of Holmes Road, which is the the uh, the project which uh, featured most uh, prominently for us in in uh, Peg's um, uh, film, and it's a homeless project in Kentish Town. I guess, why do we need, you know, if, if the macro stuff was dealt with, we wouldn't be needing homeless projects. None of us should be needing to design homeless projects. There'd be houses, there should be houses for everybody um, in a wealthy country like ours, but that's not the case. And so this is Camden uh, Council. It's an old um, uh, hostel fronting uh, Holmes Road with a very deep plan at the back. A reasonably distinguished uh, late Victorian Edwardian building at the front and rather humdrum buildings at the back. So we conceived of something else for the rear part of the, uh, part of the, uh, part of the site. So that's the building at the front. And typically, homeless projects are on corridors. And again, just sort of try, you know, the, the word sort of well-being springs to mind. So how, how can a, a bunch of people who have mental health problems, drug issues, many of them, some of them alcohol problems, very troubled backgrounds, lots of them among the most sort of troubled people in our society, how can that be a good way of getting to their, to their room? So we wondered about another possibility and we started looking at almshouses as being a much more generous and hopeful way of, of housing people, you know, mindful of, 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 of their sort of mental state and, and what might be a better way of creating a, a you know, positive environment for them. 
And, um, and so I did that drawing. And uh, so there's the hostel at the front of the project. And we created a garden, or the idea is we're creating a garden which is flanked by two rows, mini terraced houses, cottages. I hate the word microhomes. It's really prevalent at the moment. It kind of turns things into sort of functionist, unloved kind of. So little cottages. Um, they're about that wide. And they're two stories high. And um, the idea is that there's a little garden at the center of this project where people could go and work. Uh, and it would have been enticement and encouragement from them out of the isolation of their rooms into a space where they, they would be a therapeutic uh, program going on of gardening, uh, which uh, people would be open to be involved with. And, the, and Camden went for it. Absolutely brilliant. Still at Camden Council, we're talking about it with Sarah before. The, um, before, the, before this event, that still at Camden, there is in areas a sort of the, the vestiges of, of a kind of welfare state ideology, you know, it, with certain people. And, and, and so there is with this guy called Brian Matthews who commissioned this project. So when I went to see them with this drawing and, and the design, I said, we imagine a group of residents working with a gardener to create and maintain an intensely planted and beautiful garden. There'd be an apple tree or two, Potatoes, green veg, soft fruit, herbs, or greenhouse, a potting shed, and a sunny spot to sit and rest. We think there ought to be a little room or shed for private chats and counselling. The garden creates a homely domestic atmosphere in the hostel. It will give participating residents an interest and an outlet for their energy. It will help to foster a sense of belonging, self-worth, and empowerment amongst residents. It will provide people with an opportunity to develop gardening skills and encourage them to think about nu nutrition. So, um, you know, there it is. So each one, a little um, stable door uh, under a, a sort of undulating roof, the main hostel at the front, and very sort of enclosed little piece of paradise, hopefully, for them. And, and each of these, a little house, uh, a living area at the front, steps up onto a mezzanine at the back underneath an arcaded, the, the, the uh, arched roof. So there it is, don't really have time for the detail. And I, I just leave you with that one. You know, if, if this is our, our alternative pro proposal for housing at the Mount Pleasant, the contested Mount Pleasant site, uh, in, in, in my mind, it should be social housing. We've got enough housing for wealthy people in the centre of London. It should never have been sold. It's a, it belonged to us two years ago, the post office, uh, and this should never have been sold. It should have been developed for social housing. And in this proposal, it's a series of, of twittons or alleyways which crisscross the site, street-based courtyard housing, which gets the same number of units as the high-rise proposal which will be built. Okay, thank you very much. make a little kind of essay around the ideas of well-being and I'm going to sort of tag it by unpacking the project which is on display upstairs which is our uh, Pentonville project that um, was a self-initiated and self-funded project that we did for the London Festival of Architecture in June and one of the reasons that we did this was because our office, it's a sort of local project to our office, and um, our office sits halfway between Holloway Prison on one side and Pentonville on the other. So it's kind of in our backyard, and what's happening is that uh, the Ministry of Justice has decided to sell off its inner city prison estate in order that they can get the money to build super prisons out in the sticks. And as some of you may know, Holloway Prison has already been closed down and the residents there have been moved out to alternative prisons. And one of the reasons they can do that is because women's prisons are not as full as men's prisons, so there is excess capacity in other women's prisons. Um, Pentonville might follow. It's been, George Osborne said it would. But one of the problems about Pentonville is that it has a lot of listed buildings, it being one of the model prisons from the 1840s. And so developers are less interested in it. And it does pose problems about how to deal with the historic fabric. But um, so we thought it might be really interesting to speculate what might happen should the Pentonville prison site be sold and to try and show how 
architects can actually contribute to the debate about what making a, a neighborhood for well-being of the local population um, could actually look like. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about as an architect is that very often the architect is brought on board after all the decisions about density, finance, and planning have been made by other people. So on the Holloway site, for example, Islington Council have already written a planning brief before anyone else is involved, and they're marketing the site already. And what we thought is, well, before any of that even happens, it would be really interesting to speculate on what a place for well-being on the Pentonville prison site might be. And one of the reasons it's particularly interesting Sorry about this preamble, I will get around to the talk in a minute, but one of the reasons it's particularly interesting is because um, there are so many issues around incarceration and not being solved by sending people to prison. And one of the things that a well-designed neighborhood can do is actually to prevent those kinds of things happening. So by weighing up in the balance a good environment as opposed to a n dysfunctional bad environment, perhaps we can help to solve some of the problems which have become really intractable in our society. So a little bit of background about the Pentonville site. And one of the, the interesting things about it is, I mean, these are three eras of its timeline. And one of the interesting things is that it appears as this model prison, the K-shaped prison in plan, um, at the era of the, the point when um, London is getting industrialized. So it appears just at almost exactly the same time as the railways. And um, also the appearance of the meat market, which is this sort of industrialized uh, complex working through food, which is here, there. Um, and by, 19, by 2017, obviously, it's completely engulfed by the city. Um, and uh, one of the interesting features about it is it's the local prison, which means that lots of local people are going in and out of it. And it's actually quite a contested site because it's desperately overcrowded. And there have been murders and there have been suicides. And um, the reason that a lot of people go to prison are quite complex. But one of the um, sort of issues is actually who is a criminal and how are the police treating the local population leading to feelings of alienation and, um, um, yeah, well, alienation by, lo by local people. And in fact, the slide on the right is a, um, a piece of graffiti that appeared on one of the hoardings of a site just opposite the prison, which is currently being developed. And it's already going up to about nine or 10 stories. So it's very typical of the kind of um, developer-led project, which is beginning to invade even places like the Caledonian Road. So one of the, the issues that we were looking at is, you know, what is going on that leads people to get sent time and time again into Pentonville Prison? And, um, oh, hang on, gone too far. And um, we were looking at issues of deprivation in the area. Um, I'm not going to read these stats, but you can see that the darker red colors are where there's more deprivation. And in fact, it's the, the bits of the, um, typically the former industrial railway lands, this band here with the Bemerton estate down here, which are particularly deprived. And one of the causes of going to prison are things like people not being able to get on the housing ladder, um, not getting good jobs, uh, leaving school too early without qualifications, and so on and so forth. And of course, the rising price, house prices in um, inner London is making it much worse, so people are finding it more and more difficult to stay put where they were born. So uh, that's one thing. Um, also looking at well-being, what do we mean by well-being and how can we think about the intersection of things like the physical environment with your health, with your uh, social life and your material resources and how to bring those together around a proposal where these things can actually all knit together. So well-being in Cali Ward, well, that's another big issue because, again, in the area where, um, you know, where the prison is located, this area is particularly short of all the amenities which um, are used in the social deprivation indices to indicate um, well-being. And so what our, our design for the prison had to do is begin to address some of these issues about lack of opportunity, lack of open space, um, obesity, um, 
healthy lifestyles, nutrition, uh, um, access to open space, so on and so on and so on. Um, so our proposal, in a nutshell, looked at um, a way of retaining prison structures, but of sort of busting it apart and really refashioning it in a manner that um, could redeem the buildings while we still recall the history of the site and uh, think about why we might not want to go back to an arrangement like the prison represents at the moment, which incidentally are still being built. So the one down in Thamesmead is a recent example of exactly the same prison type complex. So what we've done is essentially the kind of big moves are we've kept the list of buildings, which are these, this K shape, although we've removed the central uh, point, which was actually the point where you can see all the way down and survey the prisoners. So that's a kind of uh, a important move to replace the idea of surveillance by a single point of authority and give the space back to the public and to the community. Um, we removed the buildings along the front, but we kept the listed chapel and turned that into a community center with a radio um, station in it. This is a series of live-work units which have retail at the lower level. These are flats. Uh, there are conversions of these into houses and flats. We've got a GP surgery, a, an education facility. That's a, a primary school. This is a youth center. This is the memorial garden where lots of prisoners are currently still buried. And then this is a, a range of housing which um, addresses these rather lower level units around the side. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit for you. So one of the things we are interested in is this idea of this kind of mixed community which has all sorts of opportunities for uh, different kinds of living which have... Oops, sorry, did that wrong. Um, older people up here above family units with the retail and the workshop space at the back, uh, live work here, converted uh, prison at the base, flats above, there's the radio mast on top of the um, community hall and all of these publicly accessible open spaces but more or less traffic free. And that's kind of based on some thinking that we did in our competition for Saw Island um, a couple of years ago, where we, where literally a little island like the neighbourhood in Pentonville um, was made into a kind of um, a, a new world, which um, had, uh, uh, which was on the Sustrans route, but also you know reinvigorated the place by making a kind of place apart from the city. But in the case of Pentonville, actually, the important thing is to sort of reconnect it with its hinterland. And so we were looking at all these ways in which we could combine commerce and uh, transport and ways of living and so on, actually, in this little island, and look at it throughout the course of the year, making sure that there was something going on at all times. Obviously, my recent interest has been largely around um, the lives of older people. Um, not a little bit of self-interest in that, but um, that's the work of Dwell. And, and obviously, access to local shops and facilities is particularly crucial for older people who may not be able to move very far or very fast. And so this um, space in the center has a number of amenities. This is the edge of the education facility. Here's an outdoor cinema on the edge of the community hall. This is actually a garden and a cafe, and there's space to, to do all sorts of things in there. And, I mean, we were really inspired by a trip to Copenhagen recently where there's some really fantastic things like these fountains where kids are playing and, and around. Um, and um, it allows for uh, bikes and uh, buggies and all sorts of things happening there. So that's partly what's going on in here. It's a space for people to come together. But the other thing is we've deconstructed the prison uh, complex in here, left one of the walls to make its kind of vertical garden, uh, but um, inscribed the um, space of the cells in these planting beds that go along the edge. So although you keep the vista, you lose the building. And we're really interested in the idea of the sort of productive landscape which we've got in our garden at Stock Orchard Street. And again, this is Malmo where... Um, there's cafe in the middle of a, a fantastic productive garden, which is actually in the public realm. So we're really interested in that. 
also in this idea of uh, you know, a range of living space for different kinds of people. So there might be some live work here, uh, one above another, but there might also be just very large flats there. there might, there's actually no use class to cover live work, but we think it's a really interesting idea, and more and more people are doing it, and perhaps that needs to get thought about. Um, and then, what am I looking at here? I can't remember. Um, oh, yeah, different, different housing typologies. So we've got... Yeah, so, um, yeah, we've got family housing along the edge, we've got flats here, and we've got various bits of converted flats there. And what we believe in is this idea that, you know, there should be options for all types of people throughout their lives, and depending on density, and depending on what you, where you might want to live, and that's what's in the Pentonville project. Also thinking about intergenerational worlds. So this is a competition that we did about um, eight years ago now, looking for, for a site in Newcastle, actually, looking at a kind of reinvention of the main house and the muse typology, where you can infill different bits at different stages to um, address different styles of living as you move through your life. And you have to negotiate the space outside of that. And we're also really interested in modular housing and flexible and adaptable housing. And this is some work we did with the home group recently, looking at how to make this kind of stuff that can get on the site from a lorry and um, be delivered and made in CLT. Um, the other thing we're really, really interested in, in adaptability, and this particularly is in the work that we've done on older people's housing. Um, for example, this site in Dawlish in Devon, where we've taken this flat and looked at how all these sliding walls can disappear so that there's actually a continuous route that you can walk all the way around the flat with these different views, and thinking about how the different spaces in the dwellings can capture different moods and light and views depending on what time of day it is, particularly thinking about the fact that older people tend to spend much longer in their home than people who are younger and more active. So that's a way of getting them connected with nature and the outdoors, even though they might still be within their dwelling. And then looking at education. So, we, so that's the school there um, with its outdoor space and the conversion of the existing buildings into the school with a kind of frontage that comes onto the square here. And we were thinking very much about the kind of work we've done like at Tateley School here, which is actually like an enormous Roman villa, which is organized around a series of courtyards. And uh, with the library right at the center, which has a little sort of nook above, which l then looks back over the courtyard below as a really nice way of um, configuring indoor and outdoor space together. And finally, thinking about the public realm and the importance of reconnecting. I mean, one of the other really big moves we made in Pentonville was to remove the exterior wall and to connect it through to the neighborhood outside, but to make most of it traffic free. So these kinds of spaces, again, they're in V01 in Malmö. This one's in, um, in the Copenhagen, again, with a um, canal on one side, a, a sort of shared surface on the other, and quite dense, but not really tall. And then thinking about healthy transport options, and this is the scheme we're currently working on in Kingston, upon Thames, which is a mini Holland scheme, really trying to readdress the balance away from car transit and much more towards cycling and pedestrianized worlds with this enormous um, uh, cycle parking station at the station at Kingston, so commuters can come in and out more easily. And finally, the importance of civic engagement in all of these conversations, because I'm a firm believer that actually, um, when we sort of go home, uh, we architects are not just architects, we're citizens, and everyone is an architect to the extent that they can make their home their own. And um, this is some work that we did, in, again, in the Dwell project, getting older people to think about how they might want to configure their perfect downsizer home. And we need to um, call to account our, our built environment by getting the public more involved with what we do in order that they um, 
they are participants in what is done rather than just on the receiving end of what some finance officer decides to vest on them. And one final slide, which is that I think the regulatory system is quite interesting at the moment because it's moving more and more into looking at issues of quality of life, for example, through Part M. And as part of the Dwell project, I wrote this unapproved document for the building regs called Part O, which was for older people, which is looking at how you might inscribe all the issues that make us live happier and longer in our own homes in a document that could actually get rolled out as a building regulation. So it was speculative and quite provocative, but I think it's quite interesting to think about what that could mean for um, inscribing well-being at the heart of the regulatory process. Thank you. Thanks, Peter and Sarah. So, um, this wasn't intended or planned. I hadn't seen their presentations, but um, I hope this will complement the two that have gone uh, before and perhaps expand on the specific sort of relationship between placemaking and the impact, and more specifically, the cost of design or poor design, let's say, on um, people's welfare and health. I'm going to start with a fairly complex. Um, diagram, which I don't necessarily expect you all to be able to read the details of, but uh, perhaps you can see the breadth of it, which is a diagram produced by Public Health England, evidencing the extensive range of ailments and illnesses um, on public health, sorry, on physical health, on mental health, on social health, um, that are brought on and facilitated by the built environment. Uh, everything from uh, asthma to arthritis to obesity, um, it's extraordinary that we, and for those of you who are designers in the room, have a huge responsibility to um, consider the impact of our designs on people's health and well-being. And I think the likes of the RIBA should be shouting from the rooftop about the role that good design and specifically that architects can play in mitigating some of these um, health impacts. Uh, but we know that proven largely ineffective to date. Um, and I think it's not just about, you know, as designers responding to these agendas, it's not just being about good. Um, it's about kind of you responding in a way that delivers good design as well. And I think being considerate of these um, issues, uh, whether it's light, whether it's noise, whether it's accessibility, uh, whether it's maintenance, uh, really what good designers should be considering in any case, and the results will lead to good uh, outcomes. So I thought um, it would be worth just reflecting on the fact that uh, with those ailments comes a huge cost on our health services. And it's estimated that as much as £2 billion a year, this is quite an old statistic, so I can't believe it hasn't gone up significantly since, um, but £2 billion a year is spent on treating illnesses arising from poor housing conditions uh, than is spent by local authorities on their own housing stock. Um, and as Peter's rightly said, our public investment in housing is shockingly poor. And actually, if we invested more in housing, then arguably we might mitigate some of the costs on uh, health uh, services, on social care, etc. So I thought I'd perhaps illustrate um, our thoughts on the subject through three projects, and, but touch on specific aspects of them. So I'm not going to describe them in the breadth that Sarah has with hers. I'll touch on elements of the design, and hopefully they'll uh, sort of touch on different aspects within each scheme. This is Graham Park, and um, segues on nicely from Peter's presentation because uh, his scheme that he showed earlier is somewhere here. So this was the 1960s big vision for Graham Park up in Barnet, and it failed fairly early on. It failed in terms of its um, social care of its residents, in the um, diversity, the inclusivity. Uh, you can see from sort of the, the images up here on the, on the right that it doesn't feel safe. It's very poor quality public realm. It is not conducive to um, sort of quality of life, let's say. 
And it's also, since it's grown up in, in uh, development's grown up around, you can see from this development that it doesn't connect. It doesn't forge those relationships, those networks that facilitate access, um, inclusivity, uh, and, and connectivity to the wider neighborhood. So before we were involved, it was determined uh, through consultation that the neighborhood should be redeveloped. Um, and we were brought on to develop a new master plan, which we've then uh, subsequently taken forward the first phase of. But with every site, despite its problems, and I think I've just revealed some of those problems uh, in the last image, um, every site, I believe, has some assets. And what's remarkable about uh, this site is that it has very beautiful, um, or potentially beautiful landscape. So it's got a, a large uh, avenue of very mature trees, uh, London plane trees that run all the length of the site. It has a fairly low grade park, but actually one that can be enhanced and really become an asset and a benefit to uh, the neighborhood and, and for the residents. So in terms of placemaking and as an urban designer, first and foremost, rather than architect, our approach was to think about the public realm and the landscape uh, consideration. So really, we kind of wanted to develop a design that worked to connect the park with the woodland walk and really kind of make that, instead of a sort of fenced off area, it becomes uh, a play area, it becomes a point of activity, it becomes a space for a community. And then the Woodland Walk is then connected to the park through new green streets that start forging east-west links uh, that currently don't exist through the estate to the development that's grown up either side. And then there are these moments within the development of more hard landscape spaces. Uh, 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 so Peter's scheme that he showed you down here has, has retail and a neighbourhood centre at that end. And then our master plan includes a new neighborhood, an additional neighborhood center in the middle, which will have health center and local retail. And then these sort of small interstitial uh, public spaces that might have play areas um, or, or be spaces for communities to gather, uh, hopefully very much in the so same sort of vein as the um, examples that, that Peter showed in his work. Uh, and this is the emerging master plan. Again, Peter's game just off the map here. Um, and so one neighbor center here, one here that becomes the focus for that community. Uh, it'll have a very integrated building uh, with health service, with community center, with cafe, with uh, GP clinics. It's got a nursery in it. So it becomes the glue that helps bind, um, uh, and bind the community and offers a kind of sense of focus and a, uh, a sense of place. And then the park is enhanced for specific types of uses. The Woodland Walk, again, uh, improved and enhanced for both planned and intended um, activities as well as impromptu and unknown and un un unintended um, activities. Why is this so important? I think perhaps, I don't know the reasons for this, is it because cities are becoming uh, more, we're becoming more security conscious? Is it because we have less access to open space? Is it because uh, density is precluding um, the ease, of, ease and ability for kids to get out into uh, the public realm? But the evidence is that only 21% of children in the UK play outdoors uh, compared with their parents' um, generation of 71%, uh, according to C Design Council Cape. Um, and the impact of that, again, more statistics, but I thought a good compliment to, to what's gone before. Um, in the UK, the direct financial cost of physical inactivity to the NHS is estimated at 900 million pounds. Um, and we know from uh, health evidence uh, that people uh, would benefit enormously from being able to easily get ac access and to open space, be able to walk more each day. And if your environment isn't conducive to kind of feeling safe when you step outside, uh, it's not going to encourage um, or, or allow people to comfortably uh, enjoy their neighbourhood, walk to work, walk to the transport, walk to the shops, etc. Especially for the elderly um, uh, generation, as, as Sarah mentioned. And I think evidence from the likes of Holly Street to state regeneration in Hackney has revealed that actually um, use of GP surgery in the area reduced after the regeneration because... Uh, specifically the elderly felt they could get out more, uh, exercise more and enjoy the environment uh, and were less um, vulnerable to uh, muggings and, and so on. So 
you know, designers by design, we can uh, help mitigate some of these uh, broader societal costs. Um, I'm largely focusing on well-being um, in terms of the subject of my talk, but I will just mention that in terms of the equality aspect, uh, the, our, our design is very much tenure-blind. It's um, a mixed tenure, 60% affordable housing, and it's very much broken up into family housing in terraces, uh, apartments in mansion blocks. We've got villas with, uh, that, that are, are taller um, to provide accents and um, help sense of orientation and um, uh, legibility of the neighbourhood. Uh, so we're always very conscious with working with our clients to ensure that there's a good level of affordable provision, uh, that there's a good access for family housing, for a uh, range of incomes, for different family structures, different family sizes, and so on. Um, it's just got planning last week, and we're about to take the first phase forward to uh, site next year. And all the existing residents uh, are going to be rehoused on the estate. Um, which brings me on to the next uh, scheme, Agar Grove, another client who has already been mentioned this evening, London, London Borough of Camden. And what I wanted to talk specifically about this in relation to well-being is the aspiration that the client has to mitigate the huge um, impact of fuel poverty that they have in the borough. And they're very conscious that uh, tenants of theirs are living without heating or unable to afford the heating within their homes. Um, and that obviously then, adds, again, adds a burden in terms of them as a landlord uh, and their duty of care to those residents. So they set out an aspiration to deliver this to passive house standards, which is a remarkable um, ambition of theirs. It's, you know, it is a significant cost uplift uh, to achieve it compared with um, typical housing. Uh, it's not quite 500 homes, I should say. The scheme is 500 homes. There'll be 345 passive house schemes. And then the tower, which is actually a, an existing tower to be refurbished, uh, will be delivered to Briam Excellent. Uh, and we've delivered, or just about to complete block one. We've worked on this with um, Hawkins Brown. Um, so they've done half of it, we've done half of it, planned it together. Um, and that's about to complete, and then that unlocks the whole um, development. And again, it was very worked collaboratively with the residents. They set out their ambition to uh, have new housing, and um, it's, it's a very drawn-out process. It'll be a very slow project because we have to build on a car park first in order to then allow these residents, to, or the residents in blocks here, to move into here, and then that unlocks an, uh, the whole uh, scheme. But on the specific aspect of um, passive house and importance of building performance, I think a related issue is not just fuel poverty, but impacts on uh, health, such as um, asthma. So if you're living in a damp environment or a poorly ventilated environment, uh, then we know that has uh, implications for health. So the UK has one of the highest rates of childhood asthma in the world. Uh, one in eight uh, to one in 11 children currently treated for the condition, and more statistics in terms of health, one billion apparently spent on that. Um, I'm not sure those all add up, but anyway, there are different figures from different places um, and from different years. So how do we deal with things like asthma? Well, the thing about um, Passive House is it helps manage uh, the ventilation within the home but also helps uh, reduce um, heat loss, reduces, uh, improves um, the thermal environment. So very simple things like ensuring that the buildings optimize uh, aspect due south, which optimizes solar gain and therefore minimizes the amount of heating uh, you need to provide. Simple form factor that uh, reduces heat loss, uh, good detailing in terms of reducing thermal bridging, uh, mechanical heat and ventilation, which manages air supply uh, to avoid damp and uh, ensure that there's sufficient um, uh, quality of air for the uh, amount of residents in the home. But it's not, it's not a hermetic environment. It's not exclusively uh, designed to be mechanically vented. If a resident wants to um, open a window, they can. And in that regard, we always try and design for dual aspect. Um, Grand Park that I showed you previously is 100% dual aspect. Agar Grove 
is um, likewise. And we were kind of intrigued in, our, in some of our blocks, we've developed these split level apartments. We're, the, the great thing about working in Camden is they have the legacy of Sydney Cook's era, um, Alexandra uh, Road by Neve Brown, uh, the work of Benson Forsyth. All those architects of the uh, 60s uh, and 70s did amazing work for Camden. And um, we're kind of intrigued and want to reimagine some of the, that thinking of uh, the creative um, spatial delight of split level living. So here you get views down to the garden, the other way you get views up to the sky, you get light from the top, um, and you get a really interesting uh, quality of dwelling. So dual aspect for cross ventilation, um, thinking about where you put bedrooms so they're away from the street so you get the quiet and a place of retreat, uh, thinking about detailing so that you get, you can manage ventilation as well as noise. And then in terms of passive house, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, very uh, careful detailing to uh, help mitigate fuel poverty. Probably running out of town, so I've got one more subject and one more uh, project, which is uh, designing for the elderly, and again, a subject that's been brought up already this evening. Um, again, a bit more evidence. Uh, loneliness, twice as unhealthy as obesity for older people. Um, scientists found that the loneliness was nearly, were nearly twice as likely to die during the six-year study than the least lonely. Um, so we need to be really considerate about designing for inclusivity, designing environments that allow, uh, especially um, whether it's widows, people living alone, access to uh, a supporting environment, a supporting neighbourhood. And there is a desire, as this evidence shows, uh, for people to downsize. But we don't think the right offer is there. And I think um, Sarah's work on Dwell certainly reveals the need to improve our design thinking uh, uh, to cater for this sector. Why do we need to? The biggest burden on our tax, or on our public spend, is social care. 21 billion, is that a year? I think that's a year. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, 21, 2011 to 2020. Um, hugest, the, the, the largest um, cost to our, our, uh, for uses of our tax, but catering for the smaller uh, proportion of service users, just 1.4 million people are using that amount of public spend. It's disproportionate. And uh, again, anything that I can do, anything that we can do uh, as architects to try and mitigate some of that burden, I think is great work. Um, and I think it's been mentioned already, the population age is growing, 3.8 million um, of pensionable age over the uh, next 25 years. And often our housing that people are living in at that age is unsuitable for their needs. Uh, injuries um, due to fall cost, oh, another billion. Sorry, everything seems to be a billion this evening. But there we go, a billion pounds uh, to deal with um, uh, costs from falls. And we can design that out. We can design accessible level access um, homes uh, that um, uh, improve quality of life as you grow into your old age. And uh, again, further evidence, postponing entry into residential care by one year could reduce non-care costs by 26,000. Pounds. So we're really interested in the spaces in between. As well as housing and as well as public realm, there are spaces that we're interested in within dwellings, within a complex of development or buildings uh, that will help facilitate and provide social amenity for residents. So one scheme here that shows uh, the idea of within an elderly care facility or third age housing, the idea of a, a community room uh, that can be used for bingo, for uh, events, for um, but also act as a village hall for the wider neighbourhood. And um, there's compelling evidence from 148 studies uh, that uh, communities with strong social relationships are likely to remain alive longer than similar individuals with poor social relationships. So trying to help forge connectivity, I think, is a welcome idea. And on this scheme in Lambeth, we've tried to do that through a principle of progressive privacy, so this diagram here shows the transition from a sort of very busy street uh, with a public space in the foreground, uh, which is accessible to all, into a foyer, an atrium that is accessible for residents and their visitors, into smaller community spaces that are available to share by just a group of uh, residents, as this next one shows. So you have the foyer uh, where your friends and families can come, you have community garden, which hopefully will be as rich as the, the ones we've seen earlier with uh, 
community growing and, and so on. Uh, and then each two stories, I think it's eight flats, shares this winter garden, uh, which could be for reading newspapers, for playing chess with your neighbor, um, but socializing, allowing um, uh, connections. But then if you want privacy, you can live in independently within the flats as well. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sure there are lots of questions that are going to come from the floor, but um, if you'll just bear with me, I'd quite like to just open uh, the discussion. And um, I think we've had you know, fascinating levels of detail and insight and research about the work that architects do uh, to engage with and to really consider well-being and equality in good design principles. I wanted to ask you, because it was published last week as a draft consultation, if you had any reflections about this discussion with the London plan. Um, if you don't, that's fine. But if you had any thoughts about the London plan, because the London plan really does seem to be uh, setting out an agenda where principles of well-being and equality are um, being quite heavily uh, placed within its uh, claims and its, its interests. And for example, there are obviously these, uh, uh, the, the, the idea of, and the principles of better housing, of affordability, of 40% uh, affordable housing coming into schemes, of improvements to transport, and the principle that uh, access to infrastructure and transport, which means the reduction on cars, will be a major contribution, um, and of uh, better improved uh, understandings of environmental uh, principles, along with many other infrastructure and planning processes. So I, I just wondered if you had any comments or uh, thoughts about your uh, processes and your, your senses of well-being and equality and how the London plan seems to be possibly a good mm. development of that or whether you're sceptical. Um, if you don't want to make a comment, that's fine. But Alex, maybe can I go to you first? Um, I was actually away when it came out, so uh, but I, I have read it or read some of it. Um, and as a mess advocate, I, I'm kind of supportive of the design, very evident design um, commitment in it. Um, the proportion, the aspiration to raise affordable housing provision is really um, credible and, and, and necessary. Um, I think, though, it pushes a, um ambition to raise density as a means of achieving higher housing provision and, uh, and with that uh, affordable provision. And there's a balance there uh, that I think needs really the care and attention of designers um, and a level of resistance, if necessary, um, from clients. So density, I think, is great for supporting or, or driving a, um, a growth in population that can then in, in turn support local services, local amenity. Um, it's more cost effective in terms of land use. It's uh, forges... Uh, closer connections. There are a lot of positives to driving high density, but there's also, I believe, there's a tipping point where if you push too high, you mitigate um, or, or you're, you're kind of working against good daylight and sunlight into the homes or into the public realm. Um, you're congesting uh, access. You're um, putting huge pressure on um, you know, the, the goodwill of people to live well together. So I think the, the good thing about London Plan is it does allow design to drive that thinking. The, the risk is that without the safeguard, the, the density matrix is, is going, or it's out. Mm. Um, and that was a sort of uh, the benchmark. Um, so it, there's a risk <coughs> that under pressure, density might go too far. OK, thank you. Yeah. Pete, well, I just want to say that, that just um, from experience, um, it seems. Is this switched on? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me we do work in lots of suburban boroughs, and I think that the, um, the number of things which can be done to address the housing crisis one is to end the right to buy, another is to introduce rent 
caps or uh, rent controls, at least in the private sector. And the third is to have a, have a large social housing program. And uh, I think that um, that social housing program should be concentrated in suburbia. And uh, we're doing quite a lot of social housing in suburbia, Enfield, Greenwich, Newham, and other boroughs, outer London boroughs. And I think that the um, policy coming from, from the central government of London, the GLA and so on, um, it can only really be effective if it has teeth. Because, uh, and one of the problems that we're finding is that um, uh, it seems, and I don't understand the politics of it, actually, but uh, it seems that these policies are almost advisory uh, and, and they don't necessarily get adopted by the outer London boroughs who are clinging to their image of themselves, uh, sort of uh, interwar image of, of themselves as sort of metro land of, of big parks, big gardens um, and so on. And, uh, you know, their rural id idyll is our traffic jam and um, unless we can deal with um, these um, bits of London which aren't working as hard as the rest of London uh, and which are um, having a negative effect on our environment uh, and are the opportunity as I see it for creating the large amounts of housing that we need uh, and unless the policy which you know which I really welcome uh, is actually put in to place which says that you don't no longer need three cars parked outside your house um, and that you need you know a, a 50 square meter garden uh, and all the stuff that, that Enfield and, and other boroughs are clinging on to, it, it won't really be effective. Okay, thank you. So, do you want to add any comments about policy and planning in terms of... Um, uh, I don't really want to talk about policy so much. Um, I was actually locked in a planning inquiry all last week, which is why I probably missed it coming out, and I don't really know anything about it, but I do want to say something. I mean, I would completely echo what's been said about social housing, and I think... You know, as a Londoner, I think one of the things that you know I worry about is the sort of hollowing out of the centre of London um, by sort of you know the, the global marketplace and the effects that's having on not, not the, the inability of London to remain a kind of mi very mixed community. Mm. And I really worry about that because I don't. I mean, I don't want to live in a sort of ghetto with just people like me. I just don't think that's what a city is all about. Um, and I do worry about the, if that's true, about the relaxation of um, height and densities and things like that, because I actually think that your proximity to the ground is really, really important. I'm not saying that there can't be other models, but I think um, that impacts upon something else, which is about the public realm and about transportation, because actually, I mean, I think a lot of what's, this conversation is about is actually being driven by public finance ultimately um, but I think it could have a really good effect because ultimately if we can improve um, sort of social life at street level and in our dwellings and ha other housing complexes and we can improve um, uh, uh, sort of air quality and make public transport more effective and get people back walking and cycling and doing all the other things they do with, with the, where their transport choices are self-propelled, then we would be a much healthier and happier um, community, I think. And then one of the reasons that people cite all the time for why they're not going to cycle is because it's dangerous on the road. So if we could remove um, the need or the desire to own a car and... Um, and use that in the city. I mean, I think it would have an amazing effect on the quality of the street, the public realm, and we should be really, you know, uh, pushing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So we've got a question at the front. Um, could you wait for the microphone, please? Um, it's a kind of, um, there's something that um, I was wondering that I felt that was a kind of lack of the, the, the projects that, in general, that have been presented. And I was wondering how you guys see that things. One of them, it's about, uh, a lot about uh, public realm and networking and stuff like that. And I was wondering what happened to the inner quality and the privacy that are features that are part of the well that is very much being applied now in offices, but is not being applied properly in residences. like. Like, okay, it's very good to have to see everybody, but where is the space inside and the quality of 
our in-house that we have. That's first. Second, what about taking possession of the things? Why we design for them and then why people cannot be part of the, what is the diversity in the typology that makes you take ownership of where you live and build up a community and make us unique. And the third I'm one. Gonna, no, I'm going to stop you there. So oh, there's sorry. two questions. Ah, no, no, it's just the third one. Just the third. It's, it's very quick because it links to the first okay. one. Sorry about that. That's it's okay. because when you go to the privacy and you have people from different cultures and backgrounds, they have different briefs. Somebody lives more in the kitchen, more, <laughs> more in the living room. So all this kind of inner, I would like to know how you guys see the inner quality of life. Thank you. Sorry. Well, I, I don't think it's possible to generalise about what people want from their housing. Some people like uh, have a strong emphasis on being private, and other people like being around other people. And um, so, for some people, the idea of living on the back of a pavement at ground floor level is is heaven. And for other people, living on the twentieth floor of a, of a, of a of a building with a fantastic view is, is their idea. So uh, uh, one of the words you used, I think, was a, a mixture of typologies. And so, so I think that um, it's good if we can have different sorts of housing to suit different kinds of personalities and, and people with different you know, psychological kind of needs and makeup. Just uh, our perspective, I, yeah, you can only cover so much ground in, in 15 minutes. and. Uh, probably could give 10 lectures on the same projects, um, completely different. I, I, one of our kind of particular interests in the practice is, is the threshold condition, whether that's urban thresholds in terms of transitioning from kind of large scale public spaces to smaller scale kind of uh, interstitial spaces within the public realm, or literally the threshold into the house. Um, and with Grand Park, with, with Agar Grove schemes that I showed, they very much build on that idea of kind of a managed relationship between public and private, um, whether that's boundary treatments, whether it's front gardens, whether it's um, porches or um, uh, sort of inset uh, bay windows that, that lead to the front door. There's, it becomes a really interesting design exercise, for one, because you can articulate the street beautifully. Um, but then also, I think it helps manage that transition between public and private. And I suppose the last scheme I showed, where it was very explicit in the arrangement of the, the foyer, the winter gardens, and then your own private independent flat, um, show, uh, evidences that sort of uh, interest. I mean, by the same token, I was in Holland taking students around a year or two ago, and we visited a project where the ground floor and the front of, of all the houses were a bit like up and over garage doors. And so people's in, so, and, and people were choosing to live like that, so that um, the facade opened up and people were sitting in, in watching telly and, and on their settees and, you know, um, on the edge of the pavement. And the pavement, it was all at the same level. And um, I thought that was magical. And we're all talking about loneliness and um, people feeling isolated. And, um, you know, for some people, that might be uh, the ideal. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing, and, and, and this is absolutely not facetious. I'm really interested in the ability of people to be able to modify their own environment. And obviously, I'm for choice, ultimately, you know. Um, not all of us have choice, but I'm really interested in something like, for example, this is where it comes, I don't want you to think it's facetious, the net curtain, you know, there's lots of, of buildings where, you know, the, the front windows into your living room are right on the back of the street. And lots and lots of people modify that through the net curtain. And actually, it's a fantastic device in many ways. But it's the sort of thing that architects hate because they're not in control of it. And, you know, and the idea of sort of transparency equals a sort of openness and democracy and all the rest of it is a very, very strong prevailing ideology. But actually, I think the ability to modify your relationship with what's outside through things like that, mm. for example, is really amazing. And we ought to be encouraging that because even if you, uh, you know, if you want to retreat <coughs> behind it, you have the choice. If you want to open it up, you have that choice too. Thank you. Uh, another question or comment? At the back. Thank you. <coughs> 
Uh, hi, um, I'm an architect with not that much experience and principal clients of my studio are constructors. So I don't know if you can help me to have some suggestion about to basically trick them into this kind of <laughs> architecture or any document that we can use to demonstrate them that this could be also their interest. I don't think that there's an answer, but maybe. <laughs> Oh, Sorry, could you just repeat the who you're are you talking about a client? You said to choose. Hold the microphone to yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, main clients of my studio are constructors. Constructors. Or developers. Developers. Uh, to be honest, it's incredibly hard. Uh, I mean we're we're lucky that most of our clients are public sector clients. So they like Camden as I showed, they set the ambition for passive house, not us, which is great. Um, I think, though, on private sector, that you can use evidence. It does help if the, you can show that actually good design will drive values, that creating an inclusive environment is, uh, improves a sense of security and will reduce crime. You know, they love that sort of thing when you can point to sort of statistics and evidence. And CABE, uh, and I'm sort of uh, you know, upset by their demise, but the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment used to publish huge numbers of reports with good evidence as to why good design adds value. And I mean ad adding value in terms of economic value, but also the stuff we've talked about this evening, social value, cultural value, uh, and so on. So, so do that helps, certainly. Other than that, it's probably just being kind of dogged, persistent, uh, argumentative with your clients, and you know, tenacious, I think. <laughs> I mean, following on from that, I, I didn't exactly hear, but I, I think that precedent is a really good uh, <coughs> way of reassuring people about what you're proposing. If you're if you come, if, well, it actually reassures me. If I come up with an idea and I can't think of anywhere where it's been done before, then I worry about it, which I suppose makes me a bit reactionary, but or very reactionary or conservative. But um, So if you've got an idea and you're trying to encourage a client to understand it, I think if you can say, well, you know, over in Mile End, there's a bit of housing that's a bit like that, or down in, you know, Kensington, there's an apartment building which does that. Uh, and either show them photographs or take them there. Uh, uh, and very often when we're making presentations, it's the point at which we pull out a photograph of a really successful piece of London, which has some analogies. It's the point at which they suddenly get the, the, the project. Yeah, and I want to say that, I mean, I think one of the things that um, architects have to try and make the case for a bit more is, um, you know, the cost of not doing these things, the cost to other um, areas of life. So you know, Alex's table about uh, social care and so on is really interesting because, um, you know, the cost of the NHS of bad housing, for example, or falls or whatever, it, it's kind of the, the problem in one area impacts upon another area who has to pick up the bill. Mm. Ultimately, it's all our money, you know, and we need to join the dots and see the consequences of these things as a society and actually begin to think about it in the round and, and make that case more and more and more. And in fact, one of the things um, that I'm doing at the moment is working with an organization called Real Worth, who are trying to monetize or understand what the um, cost benefits are of a more benign society such as the one we've come up with in Pentonville as opposed to constantly sending people back to prison which costs over 30k a year to keep someone there the cost to the economy of not having those people as working members of society contributing to taxation themselves the cost to family life to children's growing up situations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, child poverty and so on. So, you know, these are all costs to our society of the, the um, ignorance that we have about how it impacts upon our lives as a whole. And, you know, in, a, in an era of austerity, we ought to be taking that so-called austerity. We ought to be thinking very hard about that. Thank you. There's a question over there. Um, drawing from your experience working with Camden Council and similar councils in that effect, um, do you have any, what do you call any pros, any recommendations in encouraging other councils in, in other boroughs to become the, almost developers in their own right to then almost cut out the, well, 
the Sorry, middle. can you just repeat the second part of your question again? I was saying, um, if you have any comments or any um, recommendations to other us working with other councils or other boroughs and other councils to get them to almost become developers in their own right, yeah. as in like Camden, yeah. for example, so uh, that we could almost help question. us a little bit. <coughs> Thank you. I think there are quite, sorry, I'm diving straight in. Go for it. All right. um, we're seeing more and more London boroughs, at least, that are ambitious to build themselves, though finding different vehicles to do it. So Camden literally build themselves. They, they procure it through uh, procure contractors. And uh, where they're using cross-subsidy for market sale, they take the profit in order to plow back into affordable housing. That's a very convincing argument to other boroughs. Um, some, they are setting up arm's length vehicles. So we're working with Croydon, who have Brick by Brick, which is doing lots of good work down there. Um, and there's Red Loft, uh, sorry, uh, Red Door Ventures in Newham and so on. Um, I think more boroughs, w once there's more built and uh, more evidence of the good work that local authorities can do themselves, uh, you know, whether that's stuff happening out in Thurrock or in Camden or Enfield, there's lots of really good housing being built now by local authorities. I think that's the best mechanism. We, we've been asked, in fact, last week by one borough to show them around our work in Camden because they're interested in what the other boroughs are doing. So take um, the, the ones you have in mind to see stuff and get their, get their appetite whetted for good design and good uh, built environment. Because uh, the, the local authorities, the public sector has been absolutely desecrated for decades since uh, Thatcher abolished the right of local authorities to build housing and it's coming back. It's now, there's a re-emergence of local authorities wanting to build stuff. Um, it's still pretty small in terms of the numbers that we need. but. Uh, it's encouraging, and uh, I think there'll be more to follow. I mean, uh, yeah, so uh, following again, I'm following on from that. Uh, I think it's um, the, the will is there, and clearly um, it, it's becoming more possible to do it. And councils are kind of skilling up. You know, they, uh, as Alex says, they're, they're, they were decimated, and, and lots of them had really good housing departments, which were making housing. But in the end, it's about. I think it's about money, and until there's proper, proper, mm. proper funding uh, for local authorities to build council housing through direct taxation, they can't do it on yeah, any scale. Yeah, and I would scale. say, I mean, um, it's possible to do in London where land values are quite high, so you can cross-subsidise the social component mm. with market housing, but somewhere like Sheffield, where our Dwell project was based, where land values are so low that actually you can hardly even interest an RSL in working there, let alone get a developer. It's really, really difficult. Um, and I just don't think that's a model that works for a lot of areas outside of London. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, I'm starting a... a Architect. I'm starting an architect-led um, social housing model <coughs> with my colleague here. Do you think it's a good time to do it? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, not with this government, but, you know, I think we might be in for a new government, you know, in um, not too distant future. I hope so. And they, 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 their policy is to build lots of social housing. That's their commitment. I understand it. and manifest their commitment. So... If things go the right way, there will be money available, and um, yeah. Do you want to come on? Uh, no, um, only good luck, and uh, I think there were. What what I like about your approach is that again, historically, there were you know, Dixon Jones, uh, Grimshaw and Farrell, uh, and others set up, and uh, David Levitt uh, set up Circle Thirty Three, which yeah. was now the That's biggest right. housing association in the country. Um, so architects have done it in the past, so yeah, go for it. What's your name? Uh, we're called Hampshire for Sale Park. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. If anyone has a burning question they'd like to ask before we close. Yes, thank you. Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks for your talks. Uh, within all your presentations, I was struck by the amount of green in them. 
and uh, also thinking about the London plan, there's a London environment strategy out for consultation. I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about how in your work you see the relationship between society and nature, both theoretically but perhaps also practically, and how that impacts on well-being. I think it's absolutely critical. And, um, I mean, I think the more that we can encourage people to understand, you know, natural cycles, where their food comes from, that it's very beneficial for your, well, for your mental health to um, l look out on, be in, and, you know, understand uh, nature and its cycles, it's absolutely fundamental. And I think we, we probably don't get quite enough in um, London, and certainly, for example, in Islington, it's got the least open space of any borough in the whole of the UK. Um, so actually, the whole thing about you know planting corners and street trees and you know access to roof gardens, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can be ways of getting you out in nature and sort of understanding those things, um, even if it's not you know a park or a, you know Hampstead Heath or whatever. Um, I mean, I, I once did a lecture about 20 years ago in, in Dublin for John Toomey, and I was sort of arguing that we should have fruit trees in the streets so that people could pick the apples when they wanted. And that, that went down with complete derision um, at the time. But, you know, actually it's, it's coming back, and I think that's, you know, it's like the urban hedgerow, and that's a really nice idea it's sort of free food and you can go foraging within the city and you know if it weren't for all the issues around you know the mess um, on the ground when the apples fall and this you know people complaining about slipping on them and things like that it might happen because it's all this municipalization of everything which makes it really impossible to do things like that but i think it would be absolutely fantastic if we turned all our streets into productive gardens Thank you. Alex or Pete, do you want to add to the, to the uh, greening question? Yeah, I, th I think that um, an ecological city isn't necessarily one which is full of trees. And I think, um, you know, some of the greenest cities are, are not very, um, they haven't got kind of trees everywhere. They're just um, well planned so that, um, you know, because the big issue isn't it, is that if we don't sort things out, this planet's going to burn up and, you know, humanity be wiped out. And I suppose, um, I think that a, um, a, a, a reasonably dense city which um, doesn't rely on um, large numbers of cars where people can walk to school, walk to a local shop, um, uh, is, is one which is, is more likely to, um, uh, you know, the outcome is going to be good for the planet. And so that's another, just another way of thinking about it. I, you know, I, I really love being in a city like Barcelona where there are trees absolutely everywhere. And by the same token, I find some contemporary housing projects where there are trees absolutely everywhere and planted, plant, raised planters absolutely everywhere rather dull. I just, I just want to say one other thing. I was in um, Athens at, in um, April this year. And um, down in the centre of Athens, uh, all the orange trees were out in blossom and the smell in the street everywhere you went was intense and it was such an evocative environment to be in. It was really beautiful. Great. Thank you. Well, I think on that image, we should draw a close to the evening. So thank you very much indeed to Peter, Alex and Sarah. Thank you.